All right, thank you for joining us for this Bible study. You know, James taught in a very simple and direct manner. He didn't use highfalutin scholarly jargon. He spoke the tongue of the common person. In fact, in chapter 1, he even used fishing terminology to make some of his points. And in this chapter, he's going to continue to speak direct to us concerning Christians showing favoritism, as well as the subject of faith versus works. Um, but before we begin, please listen for a brief moment as we share something with you. If you thought the plagues God sent upon Egypt were something, wait until you see what God brings upon those who are deceived into worshiping Satan and his new world order that is arising today. I'll tell you this, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven vials, and yes, even the seven thunders are going to make the ten plagues of Egypt look like child's play. Because they are going to be the greatest earth-shattering events that man will ever witness. And more than likely, you will live to see them, for that time is drawing near as we see the nations of the world fall into economic distress and many other troubles. So find out how all this is going down by ordering our 11 DVD set on the seals, trumpets, and vials of the Great Book of Revelation. This step-by-step -step series of studies is available from our website at christianovercomers.com. And when you order this set, we will ship it to you for free and even include a free study guide that will help you understand the chronological order of these great events. Order online today at christianovercomers.com. All right, welcome back. Let us open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just pray for wisdom and understanding in your word. We pray for that wisdom so that we can be better servants of yours. In Yeshua, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, please turn with me, if you would, to James chapter 2, verse 1, and it reads, My brethren... Have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. What does that mean? He, he, what James is telling us is, hey, when you're, if you're a Christian, don't show favoritism towards others. Uh, that's not a good thing to do. In fact, it violates all the principles of God's kingdom. Because think of this, if, you know, that's the way the heathen operate. They, you know, they say, hey, you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. And they make little side deals here and there um, as they lord their power over the people. But Christianity isn't supposed to operate like that. Um, isn't supposed to show respect of persons. You know, God doesn't respect, he's not a respecter of persons either. He, um, he evaluates everybody based on their merit their good works, their faith, and their love towards him and towards others. Um, anyways, verse 2. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, you know, in other words, there's a guy that looks pretty wealthy, he's got nice clothes on, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, uh, you know, a guy just wearing beat-up clothing, uh, Looks like the common everyday person. Verse 3. And you have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing. Now, it's important to know that this word gay isn't the same uh, word gay that we use today. This, this word means nice clothing or fine clothing. He says, if you have respect to him that wears the nice clothing, and then say unto him, and, and say unto him, sit thou here in a good place. Hey. You can have VIP status because, you know, you look very important. Um, you're dressed really nice. And I'm, I'm going to give you preferential treatment. And what does he say to the other guy? And say unto the poor, that common person, stand thou there or sit here under my footstool. You know, what, what kind of an example would that be setting for others? If Christians were, were starting little cliques and little uh, groups saying, how you, you know, you get VIP status and because you look like this, because um, 
you're wearing biker clothing or whatever, you just, uh, you just stand up over there in the corner or sit on the ground over there. And we'll give that guy wearing the nice clothing a nice cushiony seat and he can, uh, he can sit in the front of the class. James is saying, hey, don't do that. And, you know, it's easy for us as human beings to want to give preferential treatment to those who, um, those who may be a little bit more like us in personality and things like that. But it's important that we discipline ourselves to treat everyone the same because no matter what people look like, no matter what their social status is, if they're a believer in Christ, if they love him and want to serve him, we're all the same. And that's important to know. Verse, um, verse 4, Are you not then partial in yourselves? This word partial means divided. Are you not divided in yourselves and are become judges of evil thoughts? In other words, what James is saying you, uh, you're divided against yourself because you claim to be a Christian, yet you don't act like one because you're showing favoritism towards others. And, and again, that's the way the heathen do it. Like Christ said, hey, in another place, um, Christ taught us that if you want to find out who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, you're going to find that person being one of the greatest servants, those who get their hands dirty, those who work hard, not those who want to sit up in the VIP club and lord it over others and sit there and say, I'm a very important person. I'm one of God's special people because, uh, you know, I just, I'm so self-righteous. You know, that's, that's not what Christ did when he came to this earth. In fact, he, uh, he spent a lot of time with common people, with the publicans, with the harlots. Verse 5. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? In other words, James saying, hey, most of the people you're going to find that are going to be heirs of the kingdom are actually poor people now or common people. It's not, it's not going to be the, you know, the big um, millionaires and billionaires. And, you know, I guess before I go any further, James isn't referring to, um, he's not knocking on people who are successful, who are wealthy, who have attained wealth through the blessings of God by, by creating products and services um, for others. No, he's not talking about that. He's talking about those who have gotten rich through ill-gotten gains or off of the back of others. You know, it makes me think of, if you want to know kind of who he's talking about, the, I guess the best example you could um, get of this today are rich liberals who want to tax everybody else because they're already up on their spot. They already have their money. So they figure, hey, I want to stay where I'm at, but let's, let's make it harder for anybody else to attain wealth. Let's, uh, let's raise their taxes. Let's keep them in bondage. And let's, let's tell all the other poor people that we're for the working man. Those are the kind of people that uh, are talked against in God's word when it's referring to rich people. Not people who are entrepreneurs, who people who want to create jobs for other people. We have to say that because some people misread the scriptures and they'll pull this out of context and say, rich people are all going to hell or something like that because they're all greedy. Yes, some are greedy. But some want to serve others and they have a passion for what they do and they are rewarded for that. There's nothing wrong with that. You know... We've got a blog on it, um, an article titled Socialism and the Bible. And I suggest you check it out because it'll go into great detail about how God approves of the capitalist system. And he very much disapproves of socialism and communism and, and redistribution of wealth. And uh, I think you'll enjoy that article. It goes into great depth 
concerning the principles of God's kingdom. So he said, you're going to be heirs of the kingdom. You know, I'm going to say this again too. We're going to talk a little bit more about verse 5 here. God has chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith. Now, if you're looking for servants of God based on their titles, based on uh, whether they have a master's of divinity or a doctorate in uh, divinity, or have gone to some other really high, sophisticated uh, center of learning, you're going to miss most of God's real servants. That's not to say that some aren't, uh, some don't go to those places. But most of God's servants were just common, everyday people like us, like you, like me. And um, in fact, you would have missed out on James if you were looking for somebody who is uh, sophisticated in this world with great uh, so called credentials of man, of man. You would have missed out on Peter. You would have missed out on John the Baptist. You would have missed out on virtually every prophet in the entire Bible. If you were looking for people of great importance, people in the VIP section at church. Because God uses those who are willing, who are humble and are willing to serve Him and to help others. Not those who lord it over others. Not those who form cliques and clubs. But those who will get their hands dirty in this world. Verse 6. But you have despised the poor. You, you, you're treating the common people like, uh, like crap. When you do that. Do not rich men oppress you. And draw you before the judgment seats. Again. Rich people with ill gotten gains. Your Hollywood elite and things of that nature. He's saying don't, don't these types of people persecute you more than anybody else and yet you're showing preferential treatment to that to that type to that class why would you do that do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which you are called don't they blaspheme Jesus Christ continually verse 8 if you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You do well. You're going to do fine if you follow that great commandment. You know, royal law here means a, a law concerning the kingdom of heaven. That's, that's what it means. And Christ even pointed this, this one out specifically as one of the two great commandments. Love, the number one being love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. And this one being to love your neighbor as yourself. Hey, would you want somebody to look down upon you because maybe you couldn't afford nice clothes or you didn't have uh, you know, an important social status? No, you wouldn't. It wouldn't feel good. And that's why James is bringing us out. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's part of the royal law, the law of the kingdom. Verse 9. But if you have respect to persons, if you show favoritism, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. You, you know, you're a lawbreaker. You're a sinner if you, if you show respect of persons because showing favoritism is a sin. And, um, well, verse 10, for whosoever shall keep the whole law, you know, someone who does everything right, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Now, before we go any further, what James is saying here is don't, don't pick and choose which commandments of God you want to follow. It, he's not, what he's not saying here, and people get this, this verse confused, he's not saying that all um, sin or transgression of the law is the same because that's not the case whatsoever because there's a big difference between someone who murders somebody with hatred in their heart versus somebody who steals a candy bar from a grocery store they're not in the same category because in god's law a murderer um anybody who committed anybody who commits murder is supposed to get the judgment of the death penalty 
You certainly don't give somebody the death penalty for stealing a candy bar. So there is a difference. And God reads the heart. What, what J, again, James is simply saying, don't pick and choose which commandments you want to follow. Do the best you can to follow all of them. Because when we do so, when we strive, yeah, we screw up all the time. But when we strive to follow God's, all of God's commandments the best we can, it shows our love for Him. It shows that we respect Him, we honor Him, and we take Him serious. And it shows that we, um, we, uh, we know that He knows what's good for us as well. It's obedience. Um, well, verse 11, For he that said, Do not commit adultery, said also, Do not murder. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou murder, thou art become a transgressor of the law. Hey, if, if, if you follow one but break another one, you're still a sinner. Verse 12, So speak ye and, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. In other words, hey, if you say you're a Christian, act like one. Do the things that Christians are supposed to do. Don't just say, hey, I'm a, I'm a Christian and I'm a follower of Christ, but then go and, and show favoritism towards others and push other people to the side. You know, some of the, uh, some of the most, um, I'll just say, in my opinion, some of the best servants I've met have been those who, you know, those who the world would probably look over. Those who may have gone, those who may go into a church today and someone would say, hey, go, why don't you go sit in the corner there? We, yeah, you don't look quite the right type. So why don't you just, you know, take a back seat? Many times those are the people that make some of the best servants of Almighty God. And it's just kind of the way it's been. Well, verse 13, For he shall have judgment without mercy that hath shown no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. In other words, James is saying, if you don't show mercy towards other people, God isn't going to show any mercy towards you. You're going to be judged according to your own standard. Because God expects us to have compassion to be loving, to, to be understanding, just like he is when we screw up. But if you want to get a little bit more in-depth teaching concerning someone who refuses to show compassion to others but expects God to show compassion to them, check out Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 25, and you'll see that God uh, takes, it very, takes a very dim look upon the uncompassionate. Now we're going to move on to a little now we're going to move on to that subject of faith versus works. And you know, if you look out among the Christian community, they argue and they bicker over which one you need. Some say all I got to do is have faith and believe. And the others say, "Hey, I can basically get to heaven by my good works. All I do is feed the poor and I do good deeds. And I'm righteous." And you know what? It's ridiculous. As James is going to point out to us, you need both. You need both faith and works. There's not one or the other. And he'll explain it in, uh, in a simple and direct manner here. He says, verse 14, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and hath not works? What good is it if somebody says, hey, I believe, but doesn't do anything? Does it work for God? You know, God can't use lazy servants. He can't use lazy Christians. Can faith save him? No way. You can't just say, I believe, and be saved. It's impossible. Verse 15, If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding. 
Ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? You know, if you just tell somebody, oh yeah, tell somebody that's starving or that's hungry, oh yeah, just, just be full and go on your way. That, that doesn't do anything. They're still hungry. Now, this, isn't a, this verse is used many times by con artists to get Christians on a guilt trip. I feel that Christians have good discernment. We know if somebody really needs help or not. And we are to help them when they are. But never let a con artist put you on a guilt trip. Someone holding a sign out somewhere on a street corner saying, I will work for food. And then many times somebody will, somebody will stop by and say, okay, I got some work for you. You want to come? Come and work. And, I'll, and, th and then they won't. Because they won't really work. They're just looking for a handout. They're looking to take advantage of people. Anyways, verse 18. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. What does that mean? Well, James is saying, hey, just, for, just because of the fact that I perform things, I work, I, I'm diligent, I want to serve, that's, that's evidence of my faith because I wouldn't work hard. I wouldn't be motivated to serve God if I didn't love him, if I didn't believe in him. Um, well, it's 19. Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. In other words, hey, you believe there's a God. That's, that's a good thing. But listen up. The devils also believe and tremble. In other words, just saying that you believe in God or in Jesus Christ doesn't even make you any better than the devils and the demons. If you don't actually do something for our Lord, that can be, hey, planting seeds, sharing the truth, uh, helping support a ministry that teaches the truth. Any, any of those things are works. Uh, using your gifts and your talents to, to benefit others in the kingdom. Standing up for the truth. On and on the list goes. Faith requires action. And um, other words, hey, the demons, they know there's a God. But they choose to uh, serve themselves or serve Satan. There's a big difference there. In other words, those who say all I got to do is have faith, believe, and get raptured. That doesn't mean anything. In fact, to have faith, believe, and get raptured is a false doctrine. Because God has never promised once to us that being a Christian or that being a servant of God is easy. It's a challenge. It's a challenge every day as we strive to improve. We strive to help others. You know, Things gotten easily aren't, aren't, uh, aren't valued all that much. You don't appreciate them. But if you, work, if you work hard and you earn something, you put great value in that and uh, it's worth something to you. And that's the way it's going to be in God's kingdom. There is no easy way to get there. You have to get there by putting forth a little effort. More than just saying like so many of our churches do today. All I got to do is believe. Be saved. Does, do you just believe? Okay, you're in heaven. Oh, yeah, yeah. Come on. Let's grow up. This, this is common sense as James is telling us directly. Hey, I'll show you my faith by my works. Verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac? his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by the works was faith made perfect. In other words, those two combined go hand in hand. You can't get there based on your own works either. If you think, if I just do a bunch of good deeds, I'm going to get to heaven, you're going to be shocked to find out that your good deeds are as filthy rags compared 
to our to the deeds of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But you know what? Works combined with faith covers over our shortcomings. When when we try hard and we screw up, hey, when we have faith, God counts it as perfect. He counts it as a, as a as a your best effort. And that's how it's done because we can't get there on works alone. But um, well, I think I read this here. But wilt thou know a vain man that faith without works is dead? Okay, we read that, and um, we go down to twenty three. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed, uh, counted unto him for righteousness, and he was called. The friend of God. Imagine that. Imagine being called a friend of God. But you know what? If you have faith and you have works, God considers you one of his friends. And um, and I, I just, you know, that closeness, that, that relationship, you, you can't get any better than that. But someone who says all they do is believe and they don't do anything for our Lord... That uh, how can how can God be friends with somebody like that? They're they're just trying to con him. They're playing games. They're just trying to find their quickest way to heaven. When there again, when there is no quick way. Hey, you know what? If you're looking for an easy way, I know of one one person who will promise you an easy way. He will tell you, hey, I've got, I've got a new and better way for just about everything. It's really quick. It's really easy. But you know what? That person's name is Satan. He's the one that creates all these so-called shortcuts around doing what's right. And he'll tell you, hey, that's all you got to do. Just, just relax. That's all you got to do. But you know what? It's not a shortcut to heaven. It's a shortcut and a direct path right to the pits of hell. And that's what many of those who are believing in this quick escape, pre-tribulation rapture theory are in danger of. Verse 24, you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. 25, likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works? When she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. Okay, she helped out God's servants. She, she, uh, she worked for him. Verse 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. It can't get any plainer than that. This doctrine of all I got to do is have faith and believe should should uh, should discontinue immediately upon reading this verse. It's that simple. James couldn't have made it any plainer. So I guess to sum this up, James gave us some great advice on how to operate in God's kingdom. Hey, don't don't show respect of persons. Treat others the way you'd want to be treated. Don't start cliques, don't start groups. Just get out there and help. Help others. Give them the truth. Bring them up. And then, then he goes on and explains to them that faith and works go together. You cannot have one without the other. Period. That's the way it goes. And in chapter 3, we're not going to read it today, but um, in our next study, we're going to get into it. And it's in a very important chapter for all Christians to read because he teaches us how dangerous our tongue can be, how destructive it can be, if we don't tame it, if we don't discipline it. And it can also be used for lots of good if we do discipline it. So don't miss out on that. But like Christ said, when he was tempted of the devil, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of the Lord. So see that you study it. See that you consume it, digest it, so that you can be a Christian overcomer.